So, um, so I would like to just say hello to everyone who's joining us. Um, my name is Anna Reed, and I'm head of research here at the PMC. Uh, a warm welcome to this fourth event and first keynote session of the Paul Mellon Centre's autumn series, British Art and Natural Forces, a State of the Field conference. The series includes more than 10 sessions and will include with a will conclude with a panel discussion on the Thursday, the 3rd of December. So please be sure to join us for that. The recordings of these events are accumulating on the PMC website, so refer to those. Um, this year, the Centre marks its 50th anniversary as an institution dedicated to the study of British art and architecture. And it's a year in which artistic practice and the practice of art history have met with the unprecedented force of a global pandemic. As a result, this series of events focuses on the encounter between artistic and art historical practice and the forces of the natural world, acknowledging that human agency and reflexive awareness of natural forces in their own right, it places such encounters in both contemporary and historical perspectives. In doing so, it aims not only to respond to the exigencies of the current moment, but to foreground some of the most vital activities and conversations taking place within the field. Today's first keynote session will be chaired by Mark Hallett and Mark is Director of Studies at the Paul Mellon Centre. So thank you, Mark, and I'll turn over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Anna. And I just wanted to say um, uh, thanks to Anna, to Ella Fleming and to Danny Convoy, uh, Danny Convoy, all colleagues here at the PMC who help make not just this event, but the whole programme of events uh, across this uh, remarkable series of webinars and lectures uh, right through the autumn uh, happened. So many thanks to Anna, to Ella and to Danny. But yes, I'd like to begin, however, by just giving you some, uh, ha some housekeeping notes, if I can. Um, it's a very exciting moment to be able to see that we've got uh, more than 50, almost 60 people already signed up to uh, this event. And just to list some of the points that uh, we would like you to bear in mind um, as, uh, as part of this event. So you'll have realized already, I think, that you'll be automatically muted when you join the webinar. I can only communicate verbally if uh, uh, we, the hosts, unmute you. Andrew's talk is going to last around 45 minutes. And as you'll have seen, we've scheduled plenty of time, more than half an hour for discussion, where we invite you to ask questions. And that's a really crucial part of making these events work as well as possible. Please think of questions that you'd like to ask Andrew uh, that relate to his topic, to his discussion, to his imagery, uh, as you um, as you uh, listen. And there are two ways you can ask questions. We'd actually prefer it, if at all possible, if you can use the virtual raise hand button that you'll see uh, as part of your repertoire of uh, instruments if you have a question or comment. And then we can unmute you and you can use, uh, you can make that, uh, you, can, uh, you can actually ask directly, Andrew directly, uh, verbally a question. But if uh, for any reason you prefer to do it slightly differently, please do use the Q&A box to ask or write your questions as well. And at the end of the uh, Andrew's talk, we will be able to draw on those questions and repeat them to Andrew and, and get his responses to them. And again, please use the chat box that we have uh, or the Zoom has to make comments or to let us know if you're experiencing any technical difficulties and our team will try and remedy, the, uh, remedy any difficulties you might be facing. So as it says there, the session will be recorded, but no photographs should be taken, please. And of course, as it goes without saying, any offensive behaviour will not be tolerated and attendees can be removed from the webinar by the host. Uh, so those are really the, the housekeeping things I wanted to report. But now I'd like to turn over to introduce Andrew himself. And Andrew, as of course many of you will know, holds the chair of Scottish Visual Culture at the University of Edinburgh. And... He teaches and, and writes in two main areas, and it's interesting to see how someone can become such a specialist and such an expert and such an authority in two very uh, distinctive areas. It's a really admirable thing to uh, have achieved, I think. First, of course, Andrew is a specialist on Scottish post-1945 art. He's written texts for artists and exhibitions since the late 80, 1980s in this area. But secondly, and I guess, of course, most importantly for us, He's become a really one of the most interesting thinkers and writers of, uh, about ecological artists, themes and methods. And those that current thinking is represented most fully in his book, The Ecological Eye, Assembling an Ecocritical Art History, which was published by Manchester University Press uh, in 2019. That's already emerged as a really crucial uh, text in the field, in the field that this conference, this conference program addresses. And as you can imagine, when we devise a theme for this, uh, state of the field uh, program. 
we were very keen indeed that, uh, that Andrew might uh, that might join us because if he's someone who's writing and thinking really gets to the heart to the center of of this topic we felt and so we were delighted that he accepted our uh, invitation and did so with such enthusiasm I'm very delighted that he's here and I can uh, introduce him right now uh, to you all and as I said we'll be talking for 45 minutes there'll be plenty of time for discussion afterwards we really look forward to the debate that follows but also and especially we really look forward to Andrew's own talk uh, uh, now a keynote lecture which is entitled great title apocalyptic conjunctures the weather of art history Andrew thanks very much and over to you thank you very much Mark um, let me just get my sharing screen up okay I take it that's all visible Yes, that's fine. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you, everyone at uh, Paul Mellon Center, uh, particularly to Ella and to Anna um, for the invitation to, to speak. It's an honor, of course, to be part of the celebrations and to, and to mark the 50th anniversary of the center. And it's a wonderful um, research program, um, British Art and Natural Forces. I've been following uh, most of the panels so far and the richness of the work um, that's being done is, is really inspiring. Um, and, and actually this, this richness in the community of art history and, and, and practice, art practice is something that I want to talk about. Um, so I'm going to keep momentum going over the next 45 minutes or so, and I'll be jumping to warn you, I'll be jumping between close textual readings, um, some, some thoughts on methods and creative art practices, of course, uh, but set within a wider reflection on um, the prospects for environmental humanities and for art history uh, today. So I hope in this kind of assemblage that I've put together, it, there's some sense can be um, made. And I will jump around between my slides. So epigraph I've chosen for um, the talk today is a passage from the great American poet, um, Adrienne uh, Rich. She can't remain a spectator, hypnotized by the gorgeousness of a destructive force launched far beyond her control. She can feel the old primary appetites for destruction and creation within her. She chooses for creation and for language. So these words by um, Adrian Rich concern the problem of how to write poetry about the experience of watching a nuclear test on television. She captures themes I want to explore here, the tension between spectatorship and action uh, between creativity and the words that accompany them. There's an ambition in Rich's words to blend politics and formal method, which fits my purpose. Uh, my historical focus is around the apocalyptic presence of World War II, the subsequent nuclear threat, and today's climate collapse. Um, this is in line, I guess, with my wider explorations on the ecological possibilities in art history and the new urgencies that surround this inquiry. I hope everyone here who has been kind enough um, to spare some time today will have reactions and comments at the end. And as Mark um, said, I, I would really welcome that. And I'm very pleased there's, there's a good time for that. First, we need to get real about our current situation. As Anna has already said, and the Paul Mellon Center acknowledges in its publicity for the whole program, this event, like all events across the globe has been hit by a natural force. I should be in a room with you all now and enjoying all the natural feedback and presence that that um, event would entail. The center talks about, quote, the exigencies of the current moment and rightly sets them alongside ongoing scholarship in British art studies, which evidences a new intensity, as it says, quote, a new intensity on the overlaps between artistic, geophysical, biological and ecological bodies of knowledge. There's indeed a new intensity around these conjunctures between art, aesthetics, writing and curatorial practices and the ecological, geophysical, and I would add political aspects of our situation. Despite the gloom and the restrictions, I want to try um, to be more hopeful in my conclusions than the current condition might allow. So a lot of my ideas are set out fully um, in the book I published last year, The Ecological Eye, 
is based on the hardly controversial belief that our historians need to calibrate somehow in their own immediate professional interests and alongside the threats and injustices posed by human-induced climate change. We do not know yet whether the formal adoption of the term Anthropocene by the International Commission on Strat uh, Stratigraphy marks a fatally negative force that the human race has inflicted on itself, but we surely do know that any corrective route out of it will be forged by communities who have paid attention to the right kinds of things and have acted accordingly. Many art historians would concur that intensity produces an understanding of the complex webs of interaction that play out in compact ecologies and material form, so artworks, cultural situations, politically induced opportunities and the like. I can see this already in the previous talks given as part of this program at the Mellon. We are at a paradigm shift in what is the true object of humanity's work, not a rejection of all that has gone before, but a repurposing and refocusing within our discipline as a cultural practice. We work within an ecology of practices, to use Isabel Stenger's great phrase, for whom a practice does not define itself in terms of its divergence from others. Each has, as she says, quote, its own positive and distinct ways of paying due attention. Some of you may be very familiar with um, Wolfgang Beringer's um, The Cultural History of Climate. There he states that pre-enlightenment European culture believed in the link between weather and human transgression. The term eco-sin captures the religious framing for devastating floods, harvest failures, and pestilence. He writes, the sin economics of the time produced the key link between nature and culture. It was the mechanism that helped a meteorological event to acquire its social significance. He draws the distinction between a punitive God of earlier centuries directing wrath against sinning populations and the sins of the capitalist scene where nature itself punishes humans. Um, unfortunately, as Rob Nixon in the classic slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor noted, um, this punishment is not meted equally. Forgive the historical compression of this slide I'm showing, which captures the cultural and spiritual arc we have traversed and that Beringer's um, book covers, namely the move from the sky as medium through which biblical symbols fly to emerging of vaporous atmospheres into which the symbols disappear and the weather is the apocalypse, um, to a flooded field and an insurance claim. To say this as directly as I can, the Anthropocene um, denotes a cultural force. The negative force of developed world humans on our planet, we are the force upon which we wreak our own violence. Art history needs to become a post-human practice rather than a humanist one to capture that change. At the end of um, my talk, I'll discuss a few select artist practices that speak particularly to the geologic, atmospheric and nuclear. But I also want to work towards that um, through a more technical aspect, um, the form and method of art historical writing. Um, how politically engaged can such formalities be? Um, Adrian Rich, the author of my opening epigraph, deals beautifully with the problem that I think many eco-critical art historians face, crafting their work from within the discipline whilst recognizing the existential threat that environmental collapse represents. When Rich writes in Someone is Writing a Poem that I can't write a poem simply from good intentions, wanting to set things right, make it all better, the energy will leak out of it. It will end by meaning less than it says. She captures one objection I have heard from art historians. Good intentions, such as environmental awareness, will not make good art history. And I think we can also add exploring ecologically engaged themes in art does not necessarily lead to making good or even interesting art. 
As a poet, Rich turns to language and wordsmithery, but one inflected with ideals of natural force, our theme here. Words are being set down in a force field. It's as if the words themselves have magnetic charges. They veer together or in polarity, they swerve against each other. Part of the force field, the charge, is the working history of the words themselves. Rich is writing about not her own poem, but one by Lynn Emanuel, inspired by the detonation of a nuclear bomb in Nevada. Rich recognizes that the power of the poem and that of the bomb have to be different. She recognizes the problems, uh, the problem in these distant events, observing that, as I opened with, she can't remain a spectator, hypnotized by the gorgeousness of a destructive force launched far beyond her control. Form, then for Rich, is a way of handling the horror, avoiding being swamped by it. As art historians, we hear the visuality of Rich's language, spectatorship and hypnotism, for example, and we recognize common themes in modern and avant-garde art around destruction, creation, language, and human appetites. Any eco-critical art history, and perhaps any art history at all, concerned with specific periods or places is about the mismatch between our craft, our practice through writing or curating, and the immensity of the environmental issue. Not surprising then that there is an increasing amount of reflection on the weather or atmosphere in the humanities, um, in history and in art history. Uh, turbulence in the um, current system, we could say, from Deepesh Chakrabarti's seminal, The Climate of History of 2009, two years later to Kathleen Stewart's essay, Atmospheric Attunements. Stewart um, sets up an atmosphere as a force field and as a lived effect, a capacity to affect and be affected that pushes a present into a composition and expressivity the sense of potentiality and event. I want to flag a wonderful contribution to a new journal called Venti from art historian Mark Cheatham, the speaker in this program. In Atmospheres of art, art and Art History, Mark expresses a desire to see art history uh, as less restful and more distressed and more uncomfortable, threatening and inevitable. My point here is that histories have weather just as weather has history. Again, um, another visual expression of what, what I want to um, turn to now. However activist or inactivist one, wish, um, one wishes one's work to be, what I think cannot be denied is that environmental apocalypse implies a collapse of critical methods, a need for wider epistemologies that marks a move from the first art historical methods that were fashioned in the 19th century, when romanticism, industrial overreach and colonial expansion produced some heavy weather towards the atomic age and now to find methods appropriate for the Anthropocene where everything has culminated in a perfect storm. This slide of three images spanning three centuries of British art again stands in for an, another arc across the atomic scale. This is why I think Herbert Reed has such a pivotal place. Much of his work is steeped in 19th century romanticism, but his journey took him through the Second World War, the nuclear threat, the Cold War, and on towards political ecologies that had more influence than is recognized. As Alan Antliff, an art historian who's studied closely anarchist cultures, notes, Reed searched for art that prefigured anarchism's open structures on a metaphorical level as form. I go into some detail on Herbert Reed um, in The Ecological Eye, particularly his anarchist views, published mainly in writings dating from the 1940s. He drew on radically organic and romantic political models of the past, but created a speculative space, I suggest, into which an eco-critical art history might use today. He invigorated certain dimensions in 1930s and 1940s anarchist culture, 
Reed seems important not least because his political and educational texts in the 1940s profoundly influenced the later politics of radical thinkers looking for alternatives in the 1960s to Marxism and of course were against the dominance of free market capitalism. First and foremost in that later effort was uh, American intellectual and ecological writer Murray Bookchin, a giant in, in anarchist and ecological ideas and their variants that he branded as social ecology. Herbert Reed also broadened the scope of art historical and practical interest, for example, with the support of the independent group in the 1950s around the establishment of the ICA in London, whose um, outline policy he wrote and which he saw as, quote, a microcosm of a modern anarchist society, end quote. Around the same time, he was active in the nuclear disarmament movement. Scholar Jerry uh, Z uh, Zaslov makes a strong claim for Reed's future relevance, asserting that Reed's example represents something of a lost opportunity, the moment when British art history sought to embrace wider contextual perspectives, a larger sense of purpose, and a radical political vision. That moment was missed. The celebratory exhibition hosted in 1993 at Leeds City Art Gallery called Herbert Reed, A British Vision of World Art, largely ignores his politics, which Alan Bowness in the book called, quote, impossibly utopian, end quote, and points to the contradiction that Reed's anarchism didn't stop him accepting a knighthood in 1953, when of course, the anarchist movement rightly abandoned him as an ally. Nevertheless, Reed predated by more than 20 years the Renaissance in British anarchism of the 1960s. His book, Education Through Art, was a work motivated by Reed's dissatisfaction with anarchism's association with political violence. Quote, it is not often realized, he reflected, how deeply anarchist in its orientation a work such as Education Through Art is and was intended to be, end quote. In this book, he argued that aesthetic education could remodel social relationships on a non in a non-hierarchical fashion. Importantly, in a context like today's, with its focus on British culture and art, Matthew Adams claims Reed as embodying the presence of an indigenous strand of radical thought that sought novel solutions for the problems of the age, end quote. And I cannot help but observe that Reed's example is precisely the same as that which faces eco-critical art history today in 2020. More a student of Peter Kropotkin that, than that of the medievalism of William Morris, he followed the former Kropotkin's model of hybridizing technological sophistication with the politics of localism. He called for social change on the cellular and molecular levels too, something that has become incredibly powerful now in, for example, the attention paid to grassroots roots activism. And I would refer you to a book like um, Lucy Neal's Playing for Time of 2015 on activist environmental creative strategies. The aforementioned Murray Bookchin, author of the classic, The Ecology of Freedom, among many other books, made numerous comments on Reed, quoted him at length, and acknowledged Reed's formative part in his own political awakening. These decades for Reed, the 1940s and 1950s, saw an overlaying of one env environmental crisis over another. The mass devastation of nature, humans and other than humans, that was the Second World War, released um, uh, the world into a nuclear future. Wolfgang Beringer quotes uh, uh, rights of the 1950s as a period of epochal changes with the rise of domestic equipment where resource colonialism and energy hungry appropriation was the order of the day. I'm struck by a similar overlay we are experiencing now, one dominated by decades long environmental crisis first registered around the time following the Second World War and now injected with a sharper pandemic that radically has changed behaviors globally in a way that the long silent ecological revolution has not. Here is a great passage by David uh, Thistlewood, an anarchist stroke um, historian working through um, Reed's aesthetic, which caught the merging of the nuclear as the dominant natural force of its time and the artwork 
that so closely echoes today's theme. This new sculpture respected the organic, but not as an exclusive priority. It expressed materializing forces, earth, air, fire, water, and harnessed them to a collective psychic anxiety in the presence of the atomic threat, creating restless, linear symbols of energetic nervousness, or casting in the solid state the visual characteristics of molten liquidity. The sculptor would exercise uncontrol in rescuing from the formless flux of molten materials solidified moments of intense significance. The gentle organic archetypes of the generation that had matured in the 1930s receded before archetypes shot through with anxiety, the tensed animal, the scuttling insect, the water, the stranger flexed for flight. Natural forces shaped much of Reed's writing from the organic metaphors that shaped his political ideology to the blitz under which he penned um, education through art, um, to the apocalyptic tone that prefigured the geometry of fear of the 19, of the sculptures of the 1950s that Thistlewood has just described. I think today our fears come in ecological form rather than geometrical form, an ecology of fear, if you will, expressed in contemporary artworks as they seek to um, process combustible landscapes, flooding, plastic poisoning, GM food distribution and pandemics of many kinds. Art historians of an eco-critical turn cannot fail to recognize that artworks are indices of natural forces and that consequently British art, along all others, is itself a natural force. I want to pick up this thread of method I started with um, using a few ideas that are still um, very much green. And I mean green in both the political sense and in the sense that I haven't developed them very far. I sense that um, cultural studies might have something useful for us through the writings of Stuart Hall and his colleagues on the conjunctural nature of cultural analysis. Hall arrived in Britain from Jamaica to take up a scholarship at Merton College, Oxford in 1951. Coincidentally, of course, the same year that Growth and Form by Richard Hamilton and others in the independent group was put on at the ICA. We have already seen in what I've offered in relation to Herbert Reed, that numerous thematic conjunctures adhere to any art historical approaches that deal with environmental concerns. I turn briefly to Hall's idea of conjuncture and explore how ecological and environmental it might be as a tool. I sense that the idea of conjuncture will help formalize and model the complex array of themes and agents that circle around eco-critical art history and make it tell a better set of stories about art and the diverse cultural periods we are all working with. Conjunctural thinking is a way of getting cultural analysis right and reflecting its complexity. It seeks to avoid overly abstract theorizing at one extreme, and on the other hand, not to drift into an excessive particularism and description. Ob objects never float, unsituated, and free from ecological and environmental urgencies. What is conjunctural analysis? Broadly, it was a term that Hall took from Granchi to capture convergent and divergent tendencies that might operate in a field of study over a particular period of time. At a primary level, moments of political struggle become key. In our context, this is clearly about those who are concerned about climate, either in their life beyond academia or within their writing, and those who are ignoring or supporting climate degradation. A second level would be the interstitial problems that cut across these positions. Again, we and others are working with the problems of nature and modernity and trying to tease out the tensions produced in not seeing them in relation. Then a third level is how the crisis, in our case, the eco-critical crisis, plays out in, on the ground in real time and at this moment. For example, I've been fascinated to see in recent writing how recurrent issues of race, so crucial to Hall, are joining in complex ways with other forms of injustice, and that includes environmental justice, something that the other two keynotes, um, I believe, will address in far more depth with far more insight than myself. 
Marxist ideas of power relations um, now are seen to include wider energies and forces beyond class and governance towards embodiment, care, responsibility, nature, and place. The social field expands towards an energetic field, more akin to Adrienne Rich's magnetic field of words I quoted above. All of us attempting to do eco-critical art history will share this sense of vertigo and challenge, trying to capture what is going on and what questions need to be asked of this contradictory and fragmented landscape. And being honest about how potentially paralyzing the complexity is when you are stuck in the entangled nature of in, uh, environmental emergency and cultural practices that it is, it is producing. Stuart Hall's um, primary problem was set around race in policing the crisis. Hall um, saw the task to calibrate black culture in Britain with the impact of law and order policies as channeled through politicians and the judiciary and the idea of local communities. Then something as intangible and atmospheric as the popular mood of the people and the communities at the time and the effects of localized poverty and discrimination. When Hall was writing, the new art history of the 1970s was a parallel kind of response. All well and good, but now the situation requires amplification and translation for post-human as well as human life worlds. This is where eco-critical art history is so important yet so challenging. It is in trying to capture the epochal nature of our subject. Art history isn't used to doing this, and that is why eco-critical art history is currently challenged to be both environmentally attuned and methodologically sure-footed. This is also why natural forces, atmospheres, weathers, and climate shape our language and practice more than they have since art history was formally established two centuries ago. This is the weather of art history that I'm seeking, seeking to partner up with and all other environmental humanities work. It needs close analytical work and it is not easy. Jeremy Gilbert, a cultural studies supporter of Hall's method, insists rightly that ecological and environmental factors not traditionally considered to be significant conjunctural factors must be taken into account for the serious analysis of many contexts. Thus, struggles and analyses at the level of the national popular are no longer separable, if they ever were, from those affecting the chemical composition of the atmosphere, geological stabilities and flows or the, organic, or the organic cycles of local ecosystems. When I read this, I hear echoes of that passage in Herbert Reed's Education Through Art, where he draws attention to his sedate writing environment in dramatic contrast to the blitz and the violent geopolitics that ravaged the world beyond his book. He wrote of laburnum trees casting their golden rain against the hedge of vivid beech leaves, whilst hearing simultaneously about the biggest air raid in history taking place over uh, Cologne and destroying it. Again, simultaneously, he notes major battles occurring in Ukraine and Libya, taking out innocent lives, as he called, quote, in a fury of mutual destruction. So I want to turn in my, in my last section to a couple of artists, Susan Shukley and Ilana Halperin, neither British but both working from here, who have something to contribute to our topic in a positive spirit of research-led art practice and deep engagement with natural forces. Malcolm Miles um, describes art practice itself in conjunctural terms in his book, Eco-Aesthetics, 2014. And he writes of art as interruption, intervention, and contradiction. And I think art history also interrupts, intervenes, and plays with contradiction that's why it's so testing to do art history well. It can shape its own operations and offer insights outwards on climate change, and cultural awareness. But back to the practice. Susan Shoopley is an artist and researcher uh, based in London and part of forensic architecture um, at the Gold, uh, Goldsmiths College. She can be put alongside a number of other artists who work um, with nuclear and environmental um, border um, borders such as uh, Jane and Louise Wilson's series of photographs uh, at Atomgrad Nature of Horrors of Vacuum 2010, 
um, or I think uh, an undervalued artist who I've written about elsewhere, um, Stefan Jek, a British artist of a Ukrainian background whose work uh, is inspired by Chernobyl. Um, for example, The Elephant's Foot, which is a glass reproduction of the foot-like and extremely radioactive remains of the reactor core and the fuel rods found at the bottom of reactor four at Chernobyl. Shupli also um, sifts through material evidence from war and conflict to environmental disasters. She also explores the way in which toxic ecologies from nuclear accidents and oil spills to the dark snow of the Arctic are producing an extreme image archive of material wrongs, always alert to the way that, material, uh, that weather, nuclear material and other natural forces have both national and global aspects that play out across geopolitical boundaries. She, like many artists, continues some of Herbert Reed's activist concerns in the 1950s and 60s around nuclear testing and disarmament. Atmospheric Feedback Loops of 2017 is a 35 mil uh, vertical film lasting 18 minutes and was commissioned for the Vertical Cinema and Sonic um, Acts in um, Amsterdam. Schupler's research in this case took her to, uh, to just south of Amsterdam in a rural setting where an open air laboratory called the Cabau Experimental Site for Atmospheric Research is tuned in to the atmospheric frequencies of nature. Its subject is the complex behavior of clouds, aerosols, radiation, precipitation and turbulence and how they interact with terrestrial events. Since 1970, the lab has been measuring and monitoring the changes that take place in the feedback loops between land surface processes and the airborne dynamics of our planet. Atmospheric feedback loops uses vertically stacked video projection to echo the shape of the tower at Cabau. The video follows two scientists who analyze climate and weather and creates a soundscape made by the research instruments at the site. As one of the scientists based there said, quote, we look at the atmosphere, we listen to the atmosphere. Because we are humans, we have to interpret our measurements. So we like to make them audible or visible to ourselves, end of quote. I'm interested in the work because it seems to be about environmental attentiveness by the scientists and also by the artist. It also stands as a metaphor for the job of eco-critical art history, which is to pass a situation for its desirable and useful character and leave out everything else as excess dissonance or obstruction to make things visible to ourselves. There's a long lineage around sensing the earth from the handmade to the technologically complex, which has interested uh, numerous artists, uh, not to say um, environmental scientists uh, worldwide. In another triptych of images to capture that arc, I'm showing you Frank Perret, a very famous volcanologist from the early part of the 20th century. Um, a video still from a work by Ursula Beeman from Acoustic Ocean and a Glasgow-based artist called Stephen Hurrell, um, working with the seismic uh, sounds um, of deep geology. So this takes me to my second artist, um, Alana Halperin. Um, as Shupley and Beeman's work, for instance, and many others show, urgency and deferral play out today on global scales as the climate crisis is articulated through the noisy voices of environmental science, weather modeling, temperature comparisons, fires, droughts, and floods. The drama um, one attaches to such manifestations all depends on how long you are prepared to wait to see the difference that will make a difference. This disorientating pivot between acceleration and urgency marks our very peculiar historical moment where the waiting for confirmatory data, for example, in relation to temperature rising or glacial disappearance, continue yet seems now unnecessary. Waiting um, and urgency are coded excruciatingly in current climate narratives. And this double aspect, this conjuncture between fast and slow themes is embodied 
by this artist, Alana Halperin, who I've worked with and written about for over a decade. Halperin uses uh, natural forces as collaborator or agent in her work, whether it be through the production of work in calcifying caves in France, silica-rich lagoons um, in Iceland, volcanic regions around Vesuvius and Hawaii, the internal human and animal mineral flows that produce body stones around magma heated thermal pools in Beppu, Japan, where you can boil eggs by the heat coming from below the pavement. And here are two geothermal um, sculptures, one being as it's extracted from the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, and one on the left is the silica encrusted um, template uh, exhibited as a final sculpture, a bridge between the living and the dying, um, that was installed in the exhibition I co-curated with Sarah Barnes called Steiner in uh, the Medical History Museum in Berlin in 2012. I'll just share one other work too of a performance Halperin did um, outside or at the, at the mouth of Fingal's Cave Staffer um, in the Outer Hebrides. Um, in 2014. And if you look very carefully, you can see me sitting on the rocks um, in front. For reasons of both time, uh, maybe both deep time and today's time, I'm only going to focus on one work, um, Boiling Milk uh, Solfataris uh, of 1999. It's a much simpler analog and indexical version of the research intensive work by Shupley but they speak to similar points on natural forces and how to capture them. Boiling milk sulfataris is not so much framed by geological fissures or eruptions, but by the slow transfer of geothermal heat around the springs of a Kravla, uh, Kravla volcano in north central Iceland. The heat passes through an extraordinary confluence of different scales, resulting in a transition from deep time to human time. Solfataris is the name for the geothermal phenomena of bubbling and bursting surfaces, mud, water, lava, that Halperin suggests captures the action of the milk too. We could go further and say that the incompatibility lies also in the temperatural as well as, as, well as the temporal. The artist is waiting for the hostile and inhuman temperatures of the earth's magma to turn into the hospitable heat of one of Iceland's geothermal pools. And she does this in a way that removes most of the artifice and intervening instruments that geological research around volcanic regions requires. It is a work of boundaries and surfaces. As Robert Smithson wrote, quote, the deeper an artist sinks into the time stream, the more it becomes oblivion. Because of this, he must remain close to the temporal surfaces, end quote. Halperin has um, described boiling milk as more like waiting for all the layers of geological time and activity to make their way up to the surface, to the point in which it's humanly viable to connect with it, with as little mediation as possible. Geological intimacy, it's a key term for her, geological intimacy can only happen at the conjuncture where both phenomena, the human and the inhuman, cohabit. Halperin's short durational performance captured in the photograph somewhat hides the fact that once it is over, the, geothermal's pool, the geothermal pool's work goes on, doing what it does regardless of human activity around its edges. In an abstract sense, boiling milk captures transference, equilibrium and patience, but there's also a very simple idea of cooking too. In a sense, Halperin's, uh, Halperin points to impatience as the reverse side of patience. Collapsing geological time through art, she asks, how can you facilitate the potential to feel something about geological time in an emotive way? Waiting upon um, becomes a form of honoring. The subordinate artists conducting a modest ritual in honor of the earth's molten interior, lying not before, uh, far below the Icelandic pool's surface. Ultimately, I see boiling milk sulfataris as an ind indigent work, 
in the sense that Carl Lavery um, uses the term. Indigence is a word that translates as poverty, but that also contains the word indigeneity in its root. Etymologically then, to be indigenous is to be both poor and also of the earth. And perhaps the most, most penurious state that we encounter is to be exposed to the elements, to live without shelter as an orphan, exile or animal. The kind of boiling and waiting time that Halperin enacts in this work is ordinary, anonymous, endless, insuperable, and very much to hand and in front of us. Okay, to start to draw things to a close, um, for the anarchist writer Kropotkin, whose influence on Herbert Reed and later anarchist thought is beyond measure, the prime force in nature was, as he put it, mutual aid. Kropotkin observed the vast majority of species thrive because of spontaneous patterns of cooperation that also permeate interspecies relationships. Qualities like altruism, the desire for justice and equal rights was the expression of and evidence for mutuality's central place. In the tough neoliberal and innovating work of research metrics, league tables and artificial internal markets and competition between universities and between cultural institutions, it's easy to lose sight of the humanities, in particular the environmental humanities, as being a place of collaboration, mutual aid and the expression of justice. You might also add resilience, feedback, responsivity, proximity and intimacy. To work in eco-critical art history um, alongside colleagues and collaborators in the arts and environmental humanities is to work in a highly energized and inspiring area. And I note that over the last few hours, I did a tiny bit of work on this, it didn't take long, which I think is part of the point, that in this window of eight hours of now, a few hours ago up to a few hours hence, there will be an environmental humanities network group in Edinburgh reading um, texts on black ecology. Will Ray of Leeds University is speaking in my own department um, of art history on what art history might tell us about pandemics drawing on Nigerian culture. And in an hour or so, you can move over to our uh, Catalyst um, talk by System of Systems on migration, extraction, and climate. All of this taking place eight hours today. And one only needs to think of this research program itself at the Paul Mellon Center to see the significant evidence to the number of brilliant emerging and established scholars and artist researchers currently working on this material. Rosie Bradotti, in her very well-known book, The Post-Human, promotes the idea of the humanities as an expression of affirmative politics. In the same vein, art historian Marsha Miskimmon has explored the idea of affirmative criticality. So affirmative politics, affirmative criticality. Um, Miskimmon did this in Contemporary Art and the Cosmopolitan Imagination, written in 2011 exploring how we um, do humanities research and teaching in such environmentally testing times. And I think there are plenty of positive signs out there right now in terms of creative practice and also in terms of eco-critical art history. Okay, just to finish, for my part, when I was writing this paper on the weather of art history and conjuring with that term, I remembered a brief moment when I was um, a teenager, I was probably about 15 or 16, and I walk, was walking around my hometown of Dunfermline in Fife, Scotland, in winter. And I passed two women at an old and pretty basic bus stop. By the way, this really happened, it's not a joke. Um, so I passed these two women at, at this bus stop, and one of the women was complaining about the awful weather we were experiencing at the time. Um, the snowy rain was as forbidding as Turner's snowstorm um, uh, illustrated here. This is terrible weather, she said. Well, her friend replied philosophically, it's better than nothing. The bad weather is better than no weather. 
And those two five women offered a wonderfully optimistic anticipation, I would say, of Rosie Bradotti's affirmative politics. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew. That was really wonderful. Thanks so much. So, uh, so many things that we could uh, turn to. So, yeah, just uh, to back up what I think uh, Danny has been saying under chat, please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you'd like to um, ask a question, and I should be able to see uh, those who uh, have, have done so, and uh, should be able to then identify people who I might be able to ask to uh um to uh who may want to ask a question first of all in fact right away before i even have the chance to ask uh, uh, andrew a question mark cheatham who's listening um would like to uh, ask uh, andrew you a question andrew so um danny can we turn mark's audio on and maybe see him and then we can hear mark's question in the in, uh, live as it were no problem mark you can now speak Great, thank you. I was just trying to give you a break, Mark. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for such a, a probing and interesting paper. And I also wanted to thank Mark and Anna and Ella and no doubt others at the Paul Mellon Center just echoing um, gratitude on the part of many of us for setting this up. It's really tremendous. Um, Andrew, there are so many things that one wants to hear you say more about, but I was especially delighted uh, with the idea that you have in your book as well about recuperating uh, Herbert Reed. Uh, perhaps, as you intimated, chances have been missed in the past, but let's not miss them again. And seeing education through art, the cover up there from 1943, leads me to this question about pedagogy. Uh, I imagine, not being able to see who's actually in this webinar, but that many of us are fortunate enough to be uh, university teachers. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about how um, eco-critical art history and the ecological crisis has changed your teaching over whatever span of time you think is appropriate. And also uh, going beyond your own practice in the classroom, how, how it might, or how you would suggest that it change other people's teaching, whether they've been in the profession for years or whether they're starting out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you, Mark. Uh, nice to chat to you um, at last. Um, and those are those are really germane questions. I'm going to back up, up one stage and say that I'm always very aware because partly I worked as a curator professionally, you know, full time for many years before moving into academia just over 20 years ago. So I had, you know, 10 years or so before academia. And I'm always wary that, of course, many of these conversations, of course, they go on sometimes at local um community levels, they go on in cultural institutions beyond academia. But of course, academia is my is my world. Um, so I'm absolutely uh, very attentive and very fascinated by how pedagogy and eco-critical art history works. A um, couple of things. I have this theme, as you know, in, in the book about non-hierarchy kind of taking tropes and ideas from, from anarchism, but, but more broadly than that, always looking to kind of flatten hierarchies wherever possible. So one of my responses about pedagogy is to throw it back to, to students. Um, and it's not very difficult to do. I, I was teaching entirely Scottish art history, post-war Scottish art history. So that included sometimes people like Christine Borland, Ian Hamilton Finlay, you know, and there was plenty of you know, eco art out there. But then I, I wrote a course called Radical Nature that was not Scottish, although it included some Scottish material. And what I noticed is A, it immediately became full. Um, it, it's never had a problem. It's run for about six years now. It's always fully subscribed. A, I listened carefully to what the students wanted to, to, to learn about. And so I'm, I'm very keen that the learning process is, is kind of broad so I, I am and that's partly also being careful about the idea of you know I'm a white professor in my 50s from you know a developed country H how I might want to teach might be different from how students want to learn so I think the ecological principles in education um, need to be flipped to empower students the other thing I would say without going on too too long but just to say what another thing is that what I have noticed is that um, colleagues 
particularly many colleagues in Edinburgh, but also many colleagues elsewhere, and also younger generation academics get it better than say people of my generation or, or older. They, they, they are already thinking whether they're working with labor or feminism or um, medieval art or uh, Renaissance materials, the eco-critical or eco-attuned art history is, is being taught in, in, in many areas, certainly not just the, um, the contemporary. So, I mean, that's not a complete answer, but there's, there's something around, around that. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Thanks, and thanks, Mark, for that question. Yes, please, again, can I encourage uh, uh, people either to uh, uh, submit questions uh, through raising the, the, the raised hand function or through our question and answer function. Either way, we'll certainly make sure that, uh, that Andrew gets to uh, hear about, uh, hear your thoughts, hear, get you a question. Can I ask a question, Andrew? I was very struck by the, your reference to the work of Ilana Halperin uh, towards the end of your talk and the way in which her own work gestures to that 18th century volcanic imagery produced by and commissioned by rather William Hamilton. And of course it evoked for me as an 18th century, someone who's worked on 18th century visual art, uh, the, the volcanic landscape painting of people like Joseph Wright of Derby and so on. I guess, and then I was thinking about all the imagery that you showed through your talk, which was a, which carried, which sh shared or continued or uh, expressed a, a certain kind of characteristics and essentially ones which would be in the history, in the kind of traditional history of art would be linked to landscape. And I guess what I'd like to ask you about is how you think the kind of eco-critical art history that you'd like to see being more widely practiced and that you feel should be practiced applies and will work productively in relation to the kind of imagery and objects that's less obviously conducive to that kind of approach. So, I mean, just in relation to 18th century art, portraits, history paintings, uh, do you see this as something that's especially uh, alive and powerful when it comes to looking at the representation of the landscape or of nature of climate? Or do you see it as a form of art history that really we should be applying and using in relation to all kinds of visual yeah. material? Great, great. Um, another great question. Again, a couple of thoughts pop into my mind in, in directly in relation to that. One is actually, um, without wishing to, for Mark Cheatham to, to over-dominate here, his book, Landscape into Eco-Art, does actually deal really well, I think, with that translation between 18th, 19th century tropes of landscape and how they are different from, but also in some sense is connected to um, contemporary art practice. Um, and, and there's a nice trajectory discussed there that I don't really deal with in, in the ecological eye. Um, but, but the main, I think, answer to your question is, is um, allows me to say a really uh, important point, which I, which I do emphasize at the end of the book, and I've also emphasized in other conversations, is that I think unlike maybe the new art history of, of the 70s, if I can be as bold as that, but certainly the more traditional forms of art history that predated that, it wouldn't be my role, and I'm, I'm not gonna ever take on that role of, of um, policing or um, limiting what one might think of as eco-critical art history. And I, and I learned that from say, uh, colleagues working in Buddhism, who, in Buddhist art, who immediately got back and said there was tons of literature in Buddhist art that wasn't about landscape, but was completely ecological in its thinking. And so my answer is that as an absolute emphatic, there is no area and there's no chronological period and there's no art practice that is unavailable to eco-critical art history, none, none whatsoever. But what form it takes is not for me um, to say. And, and, and I would say finally that the lesson here is from um, literary studies. Literary studies has got some magnificent work that makes this the, the claim very clear is that the last thing you need to do is keep returning to natural subjects like landscape. You know, yeah, of course you can do that. And of course that's a, a, the first point of call, but portraiture um, can be highly suggestive. Of, e of ecological approaches, and whether that's through materials, whether it's through subjectivity and, and post-humanism, whether it's through animal representations, critical animal studies can be brought into, you know, my, my job is, is to give, I would say, to give some confidence to emerging scholars that eco-critical art history can accompany you and energize your work wherever you go. It won't for everyone, of course it won't, just like many approaches don't work for everyone. But um, to say it's only, it, it would only be about, you know, the obvious, 
um, I, I would say the great, the great, um, what's the word, the value of, of eco-critical art history is to go, is to go beyond. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much indeed. Any other questions that people would like to ask Andrew, uh, either through, uh, yes, um, Anna, I think you would like to, Anna Reid, one of my, uh, would like to ask you a question, uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew, thank you for such a, an exciting paper. I, I was really um, lifting off from the idea of the human, that you know, and portraiture, um, and from your very strong sense here about being hopeful and um, and talking about positivity, I was really struck by the way that you described the Anthropocene and the way that you said that it it marks a fatally negative force. And I know that the word Anthropocene has become so loaded and so problematic and sort of setting it aside. I was kind of interested in this idea that um, the the kind of uh, the ge if you call it the geological age that we're in and the kind of recognition or the reflexive recognition that takes place in it has a kind of marvelous um, character to it and it seems to echo through perhaps in the way that some artists originally sort of such as Nash were encountering forces of radioactivity for the first time prior to kind of nuclear um, atomic weapons or whatever. Um, could you comment more on the role of the on the position of the human in your thinking on this. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for such an easy, easy question. <laughs> um, so I'm always resistant to, you know, humanism, you know, and I'm much more attuned to a version of post-humanism that takes on board subjectivities that are materially distributed. Obviously, you know, other, you know, animals and life forms, um, but that includes uh, what you would call inanimate, um, which the Anthropocene as a, as a naming strategy, you know, speaks to exactly that, animating the inanimate in, in, in geology. Um, so I've talked in the book and I've talked elsewhere about, you know, Panofsky's great, you know, art history as a humanist discipline as being outdated for precisely that reason that it doesn't account for, and too much art history doesn't account for the other than human. Um, I prefer the other than human to the to the non-human. So um, there's a there's a breadth there, and yet and yet, you know, art practices are humanly constructed. Although animals uh, have a role in some kind of cultural creation too. Um, so overly ignoring or overly reducing the human. This is a human event, blah, 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 but the networks and the and the powers and the and the and the vital connections that that go around, even the talk like this on on Zoom, um, are, are are more than human. So I'm always trying to you know think about in, in, uh, including more than is ordinarily in, included. But of course, the another thing to say about the Anthropocene as well is that my position is to just let the geologists get on with it. Um, it the, even the naming of the Holocene. Was named by a human. The, the 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 geological epoch we're allegedly maybe in, but maybe transitioning out of. That whilst I love reading the debates about capitalist scene, um, T. J. Demos speaking later uh, in a few weeks' time about the Pyrocene, Cluthocene with Haraway. You know, there's many versions of competing over the term Anthropocene, but the the message is clear. Is is human agency's destructive capacity, uniquely destructive capacity on the geological um, formation of, of the surface of the earth. Thanks very much, Andrew. I think we have a question, um, Danny, from Joy Bailey, who would like to ask a question, if uh, yes. you can unmute her. Joy, you should now be able to unmute. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I haven't struggled to understand the ideas that you've been talking about. So it's a fairly simple sort of question, really. The word energy comes to mind with a lot of what you're saying. It's the energy from the weather or whatever force. Um, how do you think that as a result of this pandemic, which is another kind of energy, which is dictating how we behave and what we do, do you foresee how that may be translated into art at the moment? Um, 
Are you are you a practitioner, Joy? Can I ask? Is it is it something that you work with yourself? I uh, no. I'm sorry. Could you ask that again? Yeah. Are you a practitioner? Are you an artist um, yourself? No. No, no, it's an art historian sort of. Yeah. This, that's all. Yes. I do uh, paint. I have painted many years, but I couldn't call myself an artist in that in, in the way you mean. <laughs> okay. Um. I mean, I think the way the, the word energy um, is being used at the moment in, in, art, in art history, I'm thinking of James Nesbitt's looking at land art and looking at it as, as a form of en energy use. And you've got, you know, historical iconic um, uh, examples like Joseph Boyce. And you've also then, of course, got um, artists working contemporaneously, very interested in energy flows energy as a resource, whether that's competed for like, you know, oil or whether it's um, a kind of form, a more spiritual form of vitalism. Um, so energy as a term has become extraordinarily, you know, suitably enough energized and animating in our discipline, in, in the way that we write and think. Um, I, I quite like the fact that energy as a, as a term kind of it seems pre-political in a way. It doesn't seem automatically to fall into, like if you use the word labor, which is also a form of, of, of energy, labor has got a very prescribed vocabulary and a very prescribed center, set, set of meanings. So I think the short answer is that I can see why energy itself would be inspiring for art practices. And there's plenty of evidence of that. And I think maybe going back to what I said to, to Mark Hallett at the, at the beginning, which would be, why would one limit how one uses that term of, of energy? It, 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 it's, it should be used by artists in whichever way art, artists wish to use them. It wouldn't be for an art historian to, to, to say, you know, how it should be used, but it, it, it clearly is, you know, an incredibly powerful, um, both metaphor, but also material presence. Um, and I think the virus, you're quite right, the virus is absolutely um, a form of energy, but also you could pluralize that, the energies, around um, virus is a, a, a manifold. Thank you. It's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. Um, Andrew, we have a question that's come through the Q&A box. Yeah, from UC please, Wheeler. Yeah. And uh, if I can, uh, I'll read it out so that everyone can hear it. Lucy's asked, if we have time for one more question, I'm wondering if Andrew would see art history as part of how science claims its authority in the sense that Bruno Latour has set this out. That is to say, a name to reclaim art as part of those networks around our understanding of climate. And if so, is that a strong way of understanding this for him? Um, so that, I don't know if that, that's, yeah. Yeah, I think, when, thank, hi Lucy, um, it's good to speak to you or see you. Um, or uh, when you say him, do you, you mean do you, you me? Or I first you thought you meant Latour. Um, so. I think, yeah, I, th I think this is for you, Andrew, yeah, actually. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, get Bruno on and he could. <laughs> um, I, so I'm always, I've, I've worked and curated shows in the past and become, you know, very engaged with this, some art science dialogues. And of course the binary is now so out of date and so unhelpful that I, you know, I'm, I'm always um, nervous about it. And actually Latour's more kind of theoretical work is very influential on, on me and, and many people. I mean, it's so influential, of course, is that as Latour himself has started to work with curatorial projects and with artists like Thomas Saraceno, you know, he's become an agent in, in his own critique. Um, that's not to uh, belittle, you know, his formidable kind of, kind of work. Um, so I think I, my understanding of what Lucy is getting at here is I think quite an imponderable thing for not just art historians, um, but also I think for members of the public, which is what is so fascinating about thinking ecologically, whether it's to do with art practice or to do with um, you know, wider structures within society, is the distributed nature of it. I mean, Timothy Morton's hyper objects comes into play, I think, but also you know, these distributed energetic flows that so many eco-critical um, writers respond to. So, the, so the, the, the challenge then becomes, how, how is that objectified? How is that understood? 
how is that made formal in a in a in a in a concrete sense in a material sense in a work of art and i see sometimes members of the public as well as i think professional academics struggling with that hyper object nature of artworks i mean some of the artworks that i've talked about and both of shukli and halperin i would say become more and more revealing the more time you spend with them as they unravel now that's the case for most good art but i think particularly for this distributed sense that i say latour kind of theorized um it's a challenge for 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 art um to have that layered revelation which i think is is part of its power thanks thanks very much lucy and thanks andrew we have a question from Rebecca Collins who said many thanks for the talk and really interesting to hear your thoughts and ideas. Um, and uh, also appreciate this, these greener aspects that you shared. What Rebecca's, uh, what I'm asking on her behalf is she's interested to know whether in future work you plan to incorporate aspects of Stuart Hall's conjuncture with your own, within your own writing or approach. And then Rebecca's also interested in the ways in which this might be diff differ from or be similar to Haraway's situated knowledges. I wonder, how you might think of the yeah. differences and, and or similar or overlaps between Hall's conju conjuncture, notion of conjuncture and Haraway's situated knowledges. Yeah, um, it's nice to hear from Rebecca. Um, it's nice to have some friendly faces asking questions. I, I think they're different from each other, um, but I don't think that is a is an issue. I don't think that's a negative issue why you, I would like to use and think about Hall's um, conjunctures, but but what I think he is dealing with, which I find appealing, is how on earth to corral the clear over complexity of ecological situations. You know, I will put, be the first to put my hand up and say that when I'm dealing with things like ecology and eco-critical thinking and political thinking, I don't understand everything. I can't keep up with the reading. There's a lot been happening even since I published The Ecological Eye. Um, and I think students need to know that too, going back to Mark Cheatham's question, I think students need to know that it is impossible to know the field because the field is extensive. Um, so I think that's one issue. So I think Hall's way is a way of trying to um, stop, formalize and rest on uh, different layers. Haraway's work, I think, is has been super important for many, and her recent work. Again, she's pivoted so much over recent decades to to deal much more with um, ecological, and environmental issues in very, very influential ways. But I think that's that's much more to do with being situated in a space, and your your epistemologies coming from um, your encounter with your environment. So I, I see one. This is rather abstract, but Hall rather more to do with assemblage, difference, putting the pieces together, and Haraway more to do with acknowledging, you know, your positionality within a within a, a field, which Haraway does, you know, brilliantly. Um, allows me maybe to say one one more thing here, which I think is also kind of a, important, which is that I'm very keen. I think I use it in the book. This notion of being very nervous of what I would call the circular firing squad. And I use this term, Greta Gard, the eco-feminist, is where I first read about this metaphor, but it has been used out there. The circular firing squad being the warning that people who are broadly speaking on the right side of the debate don't just pick away in rather priestly way. And I think academics can be rather bad at that. Picking away between you know, minor distinctions between meanings and terms or, or methods that are broadly speaking allied. So the circular firing squad is a negative model and we actually need to always remember that you know that the challenges here are with capital they're with globalization they're with injustice they're within inequality you know those are the those are always the issues and as an art historian i kind of want to you know make sure i'm on that side thank you we have a uh, emily brady uh, has asked has raised her hand and uh, danny again if you can unmute emily and emily you have the chance to ask okay. uh, a question Oh, Emily seems to have disappeared. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Speak to Emily later. That's another friend. Okay. Oh, oh no, she's, one sec, she's right. here. She's back again. <laughs> Emily, if you could ask, um, I think you've got a moment now, you, you have a chance to ask, ask Andrew a question. 
ah, yes, apologies. I, I lowered my hand and I think that made me disappear. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, hi, hello. Um, I'm so grateful to be able to hear your talk all the way from Texas. <laughs> okay, great. Um, but uh, I just wondered if you could expand um, on your point. Uh, you were saying a little bit about this in response to the last question about how good intentions don't always translate into good art history. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like I'm tackling that same um, issue, as it were, in uh, philosophical aesthetics and also trying to present what may be called a kind of new agenda in light of the climate emergency and the Anthropocene to my fellow philosophers. And I'm not sure that uh, all of them think that we need to be taking these kinds of issues as seriously, um, you know, in, in a... In a apart from perhaps people simply working on environmental aesthetics. So I, so I just want you to expand a bit more and especially in light of your recent book and discussions you've had with art historians since its publication. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Emily, you were, you know, so incredibly useful in the early stages of me thinking of, through the book and, you know, your work has helped a lot in that in terms of philosophical aesthetics um, to, do with, to do with aesthetic um, environments. Um, so thank you again for, for that. A um, couple of thoughts there. I've talked in Warwick about the book and it was the philosophers that got most annoyed. And, and I didn't know whether that was because I was being sloppy in my thinking, which is probably the case, but also it might have been to do with some nervousness that I think I'm picking up from what you're saying about um, du being dutiful to their own discipline and not want, certainly not wanting to be derailed by an appeal to you know, environmental awareness that for, for them, for whatever reason, doesn't appear in, in their work. So I, I wouldn't, you know, you, you would be at the front line of those kinds of discussions in art history, which is what you, you asked about. I think I thought there would be uh, more of an ignoring of it. And, 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 that, and it is true that there certainly have been art historians who think I'm just not interested in that. I think art historians I've noticed can be rather brutal in what they're interested in. And, and for good reason, maybe, um, but I think increasingly for bad reason, I think that there is now an ethical responsibility to at least explore options. I do think though, that there is, um, you know, another way, and that would be that a kind of agency that's outside the discipline. So party activism, you know, certain kinds of engagement uh, beyond your academic field is a completely, you know, again, not, not for me to judge, it's completely, um, an adequate response to being a human in a world that is in crisis. Um, it doesn't have to flip over um, your work on um, Dutch miniature painting between 1665 and 1667. You know, I still think you could do ecological art history within that field. But, you know, I, I do think there's an ethical issue about disciplinarians and how you want to take your, 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 your discipline in different ways. So one, one response would be the art historians that aren't interested stay away from this discussion and they're not here, you know, and they're doing their work. But the other thing to be honest is that a huge amount of art historians that I've been amazed at have, have embraced it um, or it was already there in their work. Um, and and not just younger, mainly younger generation art historians but not, not exclusively. And I don't know whether um, the way that so many art historians curate, or they or they know artists, there's a kind of a engagement with civic fields beyond um, academia. I mean, I know philosophers have that too, but maybe in art history, it's it's a little bit more um, explicit. Um, I don't know. I would I would love to find out how the, how your work, um, the challenges and the you know what, what what's possible in in philosophy. Okay, thank you so much. I'll I'll follow up. I, I appreciate. Yeah. I appreciate your answer. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, just following on from what you just said, Andrew, it's really fascinating to think about whether your own work has been, has been, is part of a broader, is expressive of a broader shift that's taking place within the discipline of art history in which more and more people who are curators are entering the field or, or art historians are now so much more likely to curate and then thus feel a need to engage with some of the issues of the moment in their curation which then is a kind of feedback loop into their research. I, I was, it's very interesting to think about whether you, this, your own trajectory maps onto a broader change in the field in which the kind of issues that are clearly central for curators are now necessarily becoming more 
central for art historians. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's an, it's a it's a very open, vital question. The, the, my 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 nervousness always about this, and you know, generally, I think that's a, a good thing that this that this happens. My nervousness is the way that, in some ways, the universities have co-opted this notion of impact. Mm. And it, you know, therefore, art historians might be thinking, "Oh my goodness, maybe there's an eco um, aspect to my work," and I could falsely. And impact is 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 a is a terrible formulation within the universities, um, and really reductive and unhelpful. But the the wider idea of uh, you know social responsibility, civic responsibility for your work, and trying to get that out there is, of course, a really strong principle. I think. So, um, yeah, uh, th there have been many, many more shows. And, and, and actually, if you trade, this is a historical point, Earth Art, the show in New York in 1969, was really one of the first, if not the first. And of course, it rode the wave of that 60s land art thinking. But you notice that as soon as Reagan and Thatcher came to power, the e eco art exhibitions, landscape art exhibitions, they really disappeared. And they started to emerge in the mid 1990s again and then now you know they're all over the place they're all over the place so of course they're reflecting broader um societal concerns certainly in the west and, and i think wider than that great well i could there are, i could ask you hundreds more questions but uh it looks like we are probably coming we should really wrap start wrapping things up now i think andrew and just to I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all of our many participants. We've had more than 70, nearly 80 people participating in this event. So thanks all of you for attending and for listening. I hope you found it as interesting as, I'm, uh, as I have. I'm sure you have, and I'm sure there are, it sets so many of you away in terms of thinking about your own research and new questions to ask yourselves as researchers, as scholars, as thinkers about the visual arts and about art history as a discipline. So uh, that's a perfect way to kick off our series of keynotes and it fits beautifully into the overall program of this uh, 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 of this series of events right through the autumn. I hope all of you will keep on uh, tuning in and uh, and, um, and and signing up to all, all our different events this autumn. But I could basically like to thank you all uh, for attending and to thank once more Andrew for giving such an amazingly provocative and stimulating and thoughtful keynote. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you and everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you.